It's been 14 years and Team Fortress 2 is still managing to kick it, which is kinda weird given that multiplayer casual games never really seem to stick around all that long. Of course you got your heavy hitters, you know your big dogs like CSGO and League of Legends, which have these massive competitive scenes which fuel their communities, but TF2, mm, not so much. No game stays this relevant without good gameplay, that much is undeniable about TF2. But what other factors have contributed to its long term success? When so many other high quality casual multiplayer games have come and gone over the years, what secret formula has Valve developed that none of these competitors have managed to find? Well it's funny you should ask that, because I have developed a bit of a hypothesis that answers this question. And it's called The Three External Seas. A quick side note before we get stuck in, when I say external, I mean outside of the game itself, so you won't hear anything about clicking heads, rocket jumping, or map design, because in my opinion, that's been done to death by other content creators. Any good story needs some good characters, and what better video game to analyse that than TF2? Valve blessed us with a cast of 9 mercenaries who are all bursting with personality. There's the fast numbskull, Crazy Patriot, Explosive Drunkard, Fat, Builder Texas Man, Psychotic Doctor, Australian Hitman, and their Homo Fan. Whilst many of these mercenaries are based off of existing archetypes, they still find a way to remain funny and unique through their personality and the way in which they interact with one another. This becomes especially apparent when you compare TF2's cast to other games like Overwatch, and specifically, Mercy vs. The Medic. Mercy is this medical prodigy from a young age who is a staunch advocate for peace and likes helping people through her medicine. She's initially reluctant to join Overwatch because of her strong anti-war views and doesn't want her expertise to help an organisation which causes harm. Now I don't know about you, but to me, this backstory is bland, one dimensional and pretty derivative because if I were asked to design an angel healer character for a video game, I'm pretty sure Mercy is exactly what I would end up with. Now contrast this to TF2's medic. A crazy German doctor who lost his medical license for stealing a patient's skeleton, barking for his life with the devil and treats his teammates like living experiments. If you ask me, one of these characters seems a bit more interesting than the other. And this becomes apparent for the remainder of TF2's cast as well, which explores these fairly generic archetypes but continues to layer on more and more complexity to create compelling characters. From a surface level, the scout appears to be this overconfident and obnoxious young guy from Boston. And don't get me wrong, he definitely is. But when you begin to absorb all of the lore and world building through the comics and especially the animations, it reveals this more vulnerable side to Scout, as he approaches Spy for help about his romantic interest in Miss Pauling. Ah uh, hi there, sorry to interject, this is uh, Editing Max, and I really want to put in a joke about the Scout being a pedophile canonically into this, but I couldn't work it in so um, yeah there you go. Another way in which TF2 immerses you that is often overlooked is its original soundtrack. Every class and their respective theme song helps breathe so much life into TF2 worlds and further the depth in their characterization. The Scout's theme has this gradual build up with the bongos which reflects his sneakiness and speed. The Medic's theme climaxes with this bombastic horn section which reflects the pure insanity and chaos of Medic's character. And finally, the Spy theme begins with a sustained violin note like a secretive assassin looking to prey on his enemies in the shadows until it reaches this bellowing horn to signify a successful backstab. These three examples demonstrate the power of music in communicating a story, serving as an invaluable tool for world building. I think I could write an entire PhD thesis on the TF2 characters and it just goes to show how successful Valve has been in creating a compelling cast of characters, which in my opinion is unrivaled in any other multiplayer game. With that said though, stories can grow old and become uninteresting. Especially when the last piece of world building was over four and a half years ago. So what else is there in TF2 which keeps people around? Customizability is important for any game, as giving players a degree of control in how they can express themselves is generally a welcomed idea. And it makes sense because people love expressing their creativity and style through their fashion sense in real life, so why should the virtual world be any different? Valve was actually pretty innovative in this regard, as Team Fortress 2 became one of the first games to popularise the idea of microtransactions and in-game purchases, starting on May 21st, 2009, where one hat was released for each class in the game. Now little did Valve know that these cute little cosmetics would open the floodgates to an ocean of customizability. I mean look where we are now, with over 1600 cosmetics, 220 unusual effects, 29 paints, and limitless opportunities with name tags and description tags. It's kind of crazy how much customizability is possible with just three cosmetic slots, 
And now not to beat a dead horse, but if you look at a game like Overwatch, there are only two ways you can customize your appearance, and that's through skins or golden weapons. Now the skins themselves are often really high quality, and you can tell the artists put a bunch of time into making them, but they are very restrictive in terms of individual expression. The skins come as a whole package, and you can't alter or swap out individual pieces like a helmet or weapon model. The next level up from this is a game like Fortnite, where yes, skins function the same way as Overwatch, but you have slightly more control over things like your pickaxe or backpack to express some degree of individuality. But neither of these games compare to TF2, which allows for different individual items to be paired with one another. There are entire communities such as r slash TF2 Fashion Advice dedicated to showing off the unlimited potential that such a system allows for. This isn't some underground thing either. There are over 47,000 members who create, well, good loadouts? The internet's busiest music nerd. Bad loadouts and, hmm, yeah, stuff like that too. And look doesn't end there either, because not only are hats and misks entirely customizable, but the weapons you use are too. We got strangers, killstreaks, festive skins, Australians unusuals, and so much more. The ability for your guns to shine, have some pretty lights, or be on fucking fire is highly desirable, which is reflected in the sometimes absurd prices for these items. I also think the addition of strangers was a genius way of keeping players invested in the game because having the ability to track kills and other stats is always interesting to check on once in a while to see how far you have progressed. This is also aided by the different ranks your strange weapons can achieve, and is rewarding when you dedicate so much time to a particular weapon. I mean, for God's sake, I've only just started playing again recently, and I've already managed to drop 350 Australian dollars on the game, which just goes to show how enticing these pixels really are. These cosmetics have also been important for another reason, and that's creating a fully functioning online economy. It doesn't matter if you're the most dedicated trader or not, but I bet at some point in your TF2 life, you've used either the community market or a third party website to get some items that you really wanted. The trading community has definitely contributed to TF2's longevity. So when people are spending real world money on these items, it raises the stakes. And these financial contributions in turn make players more invested into the game they are playing and its future. Ultimately, I think the strongest argument for customizability's importance to TF2 can be seen in the prices of these items themselves. I mean, if there were no demand for them, why would unusuals cost hundreds, if not thousands of dollars? And look, I know there are memes about TF2 being a war-themed hat simulator and whatnot, but the degree of customizability that Valve has implemented into the game and the subsequent economy which has emerged is undoubtedly another contributing factor to its long-term success. TF2 and Valve more generally offer some diverse creation tools for the community to create their own content. And the most obvious example of this is probably Source Filmmaker, which was released in 2012 for the community to create their own animations with their favourite characters, maps, and models from Valve's popular franchises. Many players were first introduced to the game through the Meet the series, and it undoubtedly inspired a future generation of passionate creators to animate their own videos like The Winglet, Crocodile and Sino, who all continue to make high quality animations to this day. In a similar vein to SFM are Gary's Mod Animations, which yes, I know are technically another game, but the animations predominantly feature TF2 characters, so we'll run with it. These are often more surreal in their humour and scrappier in their animation, but that is all a part of the charm. Animations like Team Fabulous 2 will always occupy an important place in TF2's history. Many of the game's most beloved maps weren't created by Valve, but passionate mappers in the community using the archaic hammer editor. Community mappers are responsible for newer maps by TF2 standards at least, like Borneo, Pier and Suijin, as well as older ones such as Steel, Harvest, Lakeside and Gullywash. In fact, the only maps Valve has released since July 2015 have been Hellfire and Mercenary Park, which just goes to show how important these mappers are to TF2. Oh, guess who it is again? That's right. It's post-editing Max. I forgot to mention, like, I don't know what, pro like, there's no one program modders use, so I couldn't really include it in, like, the three images I had going before of Gmod and stuff. So, bam, here's the transition. Whilst I can't say I'm an expert on modding, I do know that it has been another integral tool for TF2's community to experiment with. There's the good side with things like custom animations for weapons, altered particle effects, HUDs, and hit sounds, which have added yet another layer of customizability for TF2 players and their in-game experience. But there also is the not so good side.
Allowing players to direct their passion into creative avenues like animation, mapping, and modding is healthy for the longevity of any game. And at a time where official updates are uncertain from Valve, it is the content that the community makes that will keep the game alive. Because outside of the gameplay, I believe it is these core factors, being characters, customizability, and creative tools, which have allowed for TF2 to build such a passionate, dedicated, and loyal online community. I'm very thankful for that, because although the game is being neglected by Valve at the moment, it's going to take a whole lot more than no updates for this community to give up on the game.